to welcome uh, Jos Polfli. He's the CTO of Metamaze. Uh, he's coming to us all the way from Belgium. Um, and I, I guess beyond beyond being CTO of Metamaze, you're also the head of machine learning at uh, Faction, the, the parent uh, company. Yeah, that's right. And um, I, I'm looking forward to hearing about how you can actually uh, expose um, machine learning models through APIs, especially given the, the complexity of them and the, the need to constantly tune and, uh, and, and retrain models. So uh, please welcome Jos. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Tom. Um, I, I wouldn't call it so complex and, and super complex. I mean, it, it is possible and a lot of companies and thousands of companies have been doing it. Uh, but there are, however, a couple of, of pitfalls and a couple of lessons that, that we've learned. Um, and that's what we'll cover today. Um, um, so basically, I, I just want to make sure that we set the scene and are talking about the same terminology first. Um, so the first thing that I, I want to do is make sure that we, we're all aligned on, on what terminology to use. Uh, and then secondly, um, um, yeah, I'm going to introduce the perfect case, so the utopia, where everything in your machine learning model is going well, uh, but uh, it's called the utopia, so we'll immediately see some problems with that. Mainly that models make mistakes and that you need a way uh, to correct from those, and that models can only do one thing, uh, and that, uh, yeah, if your IT teams are swamped, that there are some shortcuts uh, that you can take. So let's start with that, and, and let's ask ourselves, okay, what's so special about machine learning? Uh, and what is machine learning? Well, just to set the, the terminology straight for everybody, machine learning is a sub-branch of artificial intelligence. In essence, there's two ways to build an artificial intelligence model. Uh, one is to hard code everything uh, from scratch and to have a lot of rigid rules and, and just uh, really explicitly code the knowledge that you have uh, yourself, that humans have, and explicitly transform them into a program. And that was what they did in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, but it was not super successful. Um, and then in the 80s, 90s, um, and there, was, there, there, there was like, a, and, and I wasn't even born then yet, but, but there was, there was uh, some new wind in the field um, that you can actually teach with machines. Then you teach them uh, by giving them data and letting them figure out the code themselves. So they adapt the code, they adapt the parameters of the program, depending on the data that you feed it. But data is super important uh, with that. And then what's deep learning? Well, deep learning is just one class of machine learning algorithms, and deep learning has proven to be very successful in cases like natural language uh, uh, automation and computer vision technologies and so on. Um, so what's important to remember is that machine learning models, they depend a lot on data and that they can only do one thing. They can only do the thing that they're trained to do. So every machine learning model has a lot of inherent um, limitations, being that, that yeah, you, you, you just, they only work for what you've trained them to work on. Um, and you teach these programs. But machine learning is something that's, that's very popular, that that's a lot of uh, industries are, are really looking at a lot of companies, or I'd, I'd even say most companies, 90%, agree that there's a business opportunity there uh, to build AI products. Um, as a brief introduction, who are we? Well, we build artificial intelligence products, and so we're a company with faction that specializes in that. Uh, and we have a track record of really building successful products where the core of the product is based around machine learning uh, software. Uh, and our latest one is MetaMate, where I'm also the, the, the CTO. Um, and we're built in, uh, uh, we're based in, uh, in, uh, in Europe and in Southeast Asia. Um, so let's start by explaining, uh, the, uh, and I'll give the example case of MetaMate, our latest product, but, but this applies to, to, uh, to almost all machine learning models. And I'll give the example case of what, what a perfect machine learning model would look like. And in a perfect world, um, in our case, MetaMate, it's a platform for, for automating data entry, so for reading scanned documents and then, and then extracting all kinds of information from that. Um, so you would start with, um, let me see if I can get a pointer here. Uh, yeah, but I think you can see my, my, my mouse, so that's, that's good too. Um, so 
so it all starts with with an input API. So you just upload your documents, and they can be in PDF or whatever format. Um, and in a perfect machine learning world, everything goes automatically. So you process the data, uh, then you go to document classification, um, and it will recognize the, the the document completely. It will have extracted the text 100% uh, correctly. It recognizes, okay, this is an invoice, this is a template. Then it will extract the information. Then you'll detect all the signatures automatically. You apply your business rules. These are those are rigid. That's not a machine learning uh, model. It's just code. Uh, and then you send that output. And it, if you have a perfect API, you have a perfect machine learning model. What happens is that you can do this whole pipeline. It takes you maybe 30 seconds or whatever, or five seconds, depending on how heavy your model is. Um, and it's just automated and it doesn't make mistakes and it's perfect. Um, so we went from pre-processing the documents, taking all the dirt out, making it clean, applying OCR, classification, and then, then extracting everything successfully and to, to the output API. And that's what a synchronous API could do. So the goal or the naive implementation of a machine learning model would be something like this in the current process we have a process that's manual so in our case it's document ocr that gets uh that, that gets treated by a human and then gets turned into master data and it's data entry um and in the target case we just completely replace the human with an intelligent, an intelligent uh, algorithm. That's really the, the ideal case, um, but it doesn't always work, unfortunately, um, because the intelligent algorithm can't always handle everything that you throw at it. And the first problem that we often see, well, simply said, the first problem is humans. So the machine learning model is trained to handle one type of input, one class of input, and it can be a broad class, like all invoices in the world, but still it's only that input. And then what you'll see is if you, if you, if you, if you and, and the same thing is true for a computer vision model or for a, for a, for a sensor data model or whatever. Um, so what you'll see is that what you ask for and what you train your model on is completely different than, than what you, than what you get. Um, so, what you ask for typically looks something like this. It's an invoice. This is what you train on. It's super clean. It's a text PDF. It's, it's nice. There's no smudges. There's no scanning artifacts. And then what you get, and this is real data, um, public data, real public data. What you get is something like this. It's a dirty, crooked scan that contains a lot of handwriting. The handwriting itself is written in different pens, in different handwriting styles. It's overlapping between the lines. It's not aligned. The dates here in the left-hand side, uh, you can see that the dates are across all those columns. You have things that are slanted, problems. You have text that, that, that's, that's a bit cut off. And it's just a complete mess. And this is not even the worst. Um, I, in this example, for example, if, if you look on the right-hand side, that might be a bit uh, uh, hard to see. But what you have here is a, it's a purchase order for a car. And this, is, this was a text PDF that was automatically generated. So super, super, super nice and clean. But what they did was this, this particular client, they embedded that text PDF to render it into a web page. And then instead of sending us the text PDF or instead uh, they wanted to send us a screenshot of the rendered text PDF in the web page, but not even that. They didn't even send us a screenshot. No, they printed that rendered text PDF in the web browser. They printed that on physical paper. They scanned that physical paper. And then we have all this junk here around the, the web browser title, the pages, all this stuff. We have all the scanning artifacts and the quality of, of the original document is completely lost. And this is real data that we receive. It's, it's not a fictitious uh, example. Uh, it's anonymized. Uh, that's why there are some, some white boxes here. Um, but this is really what we get. Another example, and this is the last one. Um, what you want is, a, is a, and, and even in, in the perfect case, uh, this is a date. But even I'm not sure, is this the 24th of March or is this the 29th of March? So even in the perfect case, it's hard for a machine learning model. 
But uh, then just yesterday, I was uh, I, I was preparing this presentation and and, uh, and I was reviewing some documents. Yeah, and I noticed that that some person would write this as a date, and then yeah, you you just you can't. You, there's just nothing that you can do with with, with these types uh, of data. Um, so problems. It feels like sometimes what customers are doing is just they, they want to make it as hard as possible for you. And, and they, they throw so they take some papers, they print it, they throw it in the dishwasher, and then, then they hang it up to dry. And uh, of course, the thing that they do this on purpose, but this is actually how we train those models uh, to replicate what real world customers uh, uh, do for us. So clearly, this fully automated workflow, it won't work. It's, we need some way to fall back. And what you typically do when you need to deploy a machine learning model is you deploy it, but you make sure that there's a human in the loop to handle the exceptions. So instead of claiming that we'll automate 100% for you, it, 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 it's just impossible. What we, what we always strive for in every machine learning product or in almost every machine learning product that we build, it's automation with exceptions. So we want huge productivity gains for for the bulk for for 90 percent of all cases and then have the rest only ma uh, handled by by human operators so in this case uh, maybe you have an intelligent algorithm that can already process 90 percent of your documents automatically um, without any intervention but it's the algorithm itself that will decide how confident am i about this particular document or about this particular picture or whatever and if the algorithm is not confident you treat it uh, and you send it over to the human operator and then that human operator only needs to treat 10 percent of the data um, and then but that's also exactly where the most interesting data is the most interesting data is the data that's the hardest for the model. And then you annotate that data, and then exactly, yeah, you've annotated new data, so then you can retrain the model, and, and the algorithm becomes way more intelligent. Um, so this is a bit the, the, the workflow of how that happens. So typically, you start with something like 90%. In some cases, for very unstructured and hard data, it's even as low as 50% automation rate that you start with. You start with 50%. But because you, you, you work in tandem, the algorithm and the human in the beginning, the humans have a little more effort, but asymptotically, so, so if, if you label it up, you'll, you'll reach uh, more and more automation up until 99% uh, uh, in certain cases for, for easy to manage documents. And that's a really important concept that you'll need humans in the loop to add additional data, to add additional training data, and to handle the exceptions. And this does not mean that it necessarily happens live. In certain cases, you can do it uh, after the fact, say two weeks or a month later. In certain cases, you need to do it live. Um, in the case of MetaMaze, for example, how we do that is, yeah, we make sure that there's an insight in the machine learning pipeline end to end. So it's not just an API that will always respond. It's an API that will respond with 90% of the time with the correct values and the extracted values, but 10% of the time it will respond with, sorry, I don't know how to handle this. And you need a way to, to deal with that human intervention. So what we did, and, and it's, it, it's of course depends on, on what exactly your application is, but what we did is we, we, we uh, and what you see on the left screenshot is we have a lot of insight into our machine learning pipeline where you can see every step. So in this, Upload, for example, we had five invoice documents. Um, they were all processed automatically in OCR, no problem. Document type was recognized automatically, no problem. Entity extraction, too. But then this upload, for example, you see that for two invoices, they were one of those weird ones um, that we don't know what to do with. Um, and then uh, and, and they couldn't be processed uh, automatically. Um, what we also do is we, we, we make it super user friendly for, for our users that if the algorithm doesn't know uh, what to do, that you just say to the user, this exactly is the piece where the algorithm is, uh, is, is having issues. So you still try to give as much as possible uh, to the algorithm, and you just alert the user. In this case, for example, it, it's, it's only the contact phone that says, hey, here you can see the confidence of the, of the prediction that has below the threshold of 80%. So you can just say, okay, in this case, I just, I, I'm only, 
of this whole document, of this invoice. I've, I've treated 15 entities. I've found them uh, uh, without a problem. But this particular one, yeah, you really need to check that. And that's already a fast, fast, a big, big productivity improvement over uh, just having to do everything manually. So that's a good case when you have a standard document and at least your model is trained on the document that you receive. But depending on your application, that might not be the case. You might have something that's completely new. So for example, if you, if you, if you have something uh, in an application and you would have support for invoices and purchase order bill of lading and so on, but that doesn't really serve all, all customers. Maybe a customer wants to use it in a, in a different way and they want to have a bank specific credit agreement, for example, or a device failure report, something that's not yet pre-trained. So what we've seen, before is like the, the two bottom layers of this process. It's where you have the API input, you have a semi-automatic processing flow. Most of the time it's automatic, but there's exceptions. So it's, it's, it's automation with exceptions. Um, and then you output that. That's one part of the flow. But that, that's good for existing machine learning models, or if you only have one or two or 10 machine learning models, that's fine. But sometimes, for example, in MetaMate, you want to support custom models as well. And what you then need to do is before you can start using this, this automated API, you need to extend that with a management tool, with a, with a management, and, and that can either be UI or API calls, but you need to extend your existing API to be able to manage your training data and manage the structure of your model. And that structure of your model uh, are things in this example, uh, but for you it will be different. In this example, it's like document types, it's entities, it's uh, how to deal with page management. Um, and then you train that model and then you can deploy that model. Um, so we built the user interface around it because we want to expose it to business users. Uh, but in the back end, it's all just a APIs. Uh, and, yeah, and we can expose those APIs as well, where you can add document types, you can add entities, have all kinds of configuration for entities, the type of entities, how many times it can occur, add your business rules, uh, your business patterns, uh, and, and even uh, your authentication and, and so on. And what it looks like then, I mean, deploying machine learning models, in essence, it, it's actually simple. Eh? As long as you have only one, one machine learning model or a couple of machine learning models and you can do it manually, it's actually simple. You build a facade and an API endpoint, you just have it served user using Kubernetes, uh, uh, using TensorFlow serving or something else. Um, but the complexity comes from not having to serve 10 models, but, but having to serve a thousand different models. Um, so in our case, how we do that is we have uh, an orchestrator that just written in a, in a JavaScript backend, a Node backend. Um, and if you, if the user requests a training for a model because they updated their training data. Um, you go to a training job launcher that's cute. It launches a Kubernetes job. Then in a, in a separate training bot, it, it, it gets all the data, collects all the data, does all kinds of validation, and then just, just and, and then trains that model and then serves that model in our model repository. Once that model is in the model repository, um, we send a message back, okay, the training is finished, and then it's up to the user to decide, do I want to deploy this model or not? So you send all kinds of accuracy metrics back as well, and the user needs to decide, okay, do you want to deploy this? If they deploy it, we update the deployment configuration, um, that's here in the, in the bottom under the serving folder, where you have different config files so that you can automatically uh, scale vertically, scale horizontally, and so on. Uh, and once something is deployed, um, so it will, keep, it will get this from the model repository, put it in NetSurfle serving, and then you can have your extract service just uh, call uh, the specific model with that specific version that you want to load. So, very good. Um, we have a fully automated pipeline, and you can see uh, one, things are good, we can just completely automate it end-to-end. -end. That's super good. Um, but in certain cases, um, uh, it doesn't work, and you need some form of human uh, manual intervention. Um, you need a way to fall back to have a human in the loop for when things are, are, are not 100% uh, uh, perfect. Thirdly, what you really need is a way to manage your training data, and that is something that we have noticed that really takes uh, takes takes a lot of conscious effort 
Um, you can't just leave managing training data to your customers because they'll 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 uh, put all kinds of junk in it. Um, you really need to have that to to help your customers for any machine learning data that you do to increase that data quality um, as much as possible. And then in certain cases, um, you you want to or you need to support custom models, um, and that's when you get to a, a, a multi-tenant architecture. So so an architecture that where where you have different customers that each have their own model repository or one model repository, but that's that's multi-tenant and supports multiple uh, models from multiple customers, um, and that has some degree of of, of complexity. Um, you can either use homegrown tools for that um, or, or even adopt model management frameworks like Kubeflow or Selden or Pachyderm, for example. Um, and, that's, that, and that's not always needed in, 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 in every product. Some products need it, uh, some don't. If you only have one machine learning model, um, then, then, then you can skip most of that thing. You still want to automate certain parts of it and have a good MLOps pipeline. Uh, which, which you don't really uh, need, need to have that fully, fully automated uh, uh, like we do uh, in some of our products. So we're done. We have a fully automated pipeline. We have human intervention. We have training data. And we can train and configure multi-tenant custom models. It's fully automated. So then you go to a client and you can say, look, I have a very successful pipeline everything works we figure we've worked through all the problems we've been working on this for two three years our models are state of the art and then you say customer i can deliver something uh, something a uh, dear client i can deliver something for you a trained model that works that automates 90 percent of your your workflow i can deliver it in four weeks and then the customer answers i have it our it team needs two years to implement a simple api and this is hopefully recognizable or, or maybe recognizable um, that, that sometimes some IT teams are so overwhelmed or, 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 or have so, so such crucial uh, systems to manage, for example, in banks and, uh, and, and certain telcos, um, that, yeah, that that's really not an option to, to have a proper clean API integration. And what we found is that uh, on, on that front, there's actually a very good symbiosis, a, a very good partnership between robotic process automation and, and artificial intelligence. And, and that's where we use it, typically a combination of both. You have RPA that does the rules, the data collection, getting the data into the API endpoint. Um, and then you have machine learning models that, that, that do the heavy lifting and, and the, 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 the fuzzier logic and the things that, that are harder and that you can't really code anymore. And that's a very nice combination, I think, of, of using RPA to quickly deploy AI models. So you have AI models that, that, are, that have the intelligence, but it's RPA is, is a great way of, of deploying those AI models without uh, having to wait on, on, on sometimes overwhelmed uh, IT teams uh, at, uh, at some of, uh, of the larger customers uh, that we have. Um, so just to recap, we started with the perfect case, machine learning models that don't make mistakes, um, but there's a rainy reality check there. They don't really exist, or, or depending on the case that you do, of course. If your model makes mistakes, the, the solution is always to have a human in the loop, and that can either be live, it can be uh, that, that you really block the API call, or you can return best effort and then treat it separately. But your models will decline over time, so what you really need to do um, it's make sure that you can you can label additional data to make sure that your model quality will remain high. Otherwise, your model will decline over time because your input always changes over time as well in any machine learning case. Um, sometimes you need custom models. Um, in that case, you can use multi-tenant models and, and, and have custom solutions like the, the one that we built. Um, and then if your company's IT team is overwhelmed, um, well, um, you can always uh, try to, to use some form of, of RPA to circumvent the need of implementing a, a, an API. Um, that's, of course, only the, the top of the iceberg. Um, so uh, I'm thinking that there, there hopefully uh, will be some questions uh, to ask. So thanks for your attention and thanks for uh, the invitation. And I look forward to, to seeing some of your questions. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jos. The, um, uh, we do have a question from Nitin, and I think you, you started to uh, discuss this. 
Um, mm -hmm. But he, he was particularly interested in solving the multi-environment problem. You hinted at this, um, mm -hmm. the multi-environment problem um, challenge when you're taking a, a machine learning model development through to deployment. Um, yeah. Uh, and particularly in a multi, I, I, I think you mentioned multi-tenanted, but you didn't, yeah. but Nitin is also interested in the multi-cloud. Um, because I think uh, MetaMaze is built on Azure, isn't that? But uh, yeah, you, exactly. you also deal with other, other cloud environments? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, so all this architecture, and you can still see my screen, eh? um, so all this architecture, um, what you see here, if you have multi-tenant models, okay, this is a simplified here. So you have a folder models here in the in Azure Blob Storage Start, uh, but this is a simplified view. What we have uh, actually, of course, is a hierarchy where you start with an, a partner ID, then you go to an organization ID, then in that organization, you can have multiple projects. Within that project, you can have, have multiple document types. Every document type has their own model. Every model has multiple versions. So this is this is a simplified view, but that's how you, how, how you can store your, uh, your model repository. Um, and then if you want to deploy this in a multi-cloud strategy, uh, then what you just need to do is make sure that you keep those in sync so that you either have one central central model repository that gets replicated across multiple clouds, or in certain cases, you can just mount Azure Block Storage, for example, as a, as a Kubernetes persistent volume, um, or do the same thing if you have uh, Amazon S3 Storage or GCP, uh, um, Google Cloud Platform from Storage. And then the same with the configs, so you just need to keep those in sync uh, to make sure that you that you support uh, multiple multiple clouds. Um, there's one tidbit that I indeed didn't touch on is that you have multiple environments as in um, uh, Dev UAP staging test environments. Sometimes you want to share models across that. Um, and how we solve that is, is, is literally by having multiple versions of this model repository. Uh, and then if we need a model to migrate from one environment to another, we just copy it. That's, that's basically the other option is that you do it centralized way and you have some form of a tag of, of this is running in depth and this is in, in production. But we really didn't want to mix any production data with any uh, development and test data. So in our case, it's set up completely separately. But that's a decision uh, each has to make on their own, of course. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Jos. That's uh, a very detailed uh, view of, of the whole uh, life cycle.